n, and then we had k minus n over k. So the piece of the equation that's new for both, for species one, it's this part, and for species two, it's this part. This alpha times population size part. This is the uh, computation uh, coefficient, and I'll talk more about that in details, but you should recognize at least this starting part is the logistic growth model. dn over dt equals rn times k minus n over k. Okay, all right, and so, um, Species one and species two, the numbers there, the subscripts that you see throughout the equation now are reflecting those different species. So that now we have dn1 over d2, so it means we're talking about species one. Here we have dn2 over dt, means we're talking about species two, right? So r, if you remember, that's the uh, maximum instantaneous per capita growth rate. We had it subscripted with an m in the equation for maximum. But now, so R1 is now the maximum per capita growth rate for species one, okay? And then K1, so that's carrying capacity for species one, okay? And so similarly, species two, so this is the maximum per capita growth rate now, the RM value for species two, population size for species two, carrying capacity for species two, okay? So the subscript is telling you which species we're referring to. And again, the new symbol that's here now is this alpha, with a subscript times population size. And again, this is the competition coefficient. Okay, and we'll talk about that in more detail, but that is the piece that's new in both of those equations. Okay, so, so more about that, um, that new part of it, this new, which is added, which is this alpha value, which is this competition coefficient. And so it's important, this is the important piece that adds the interspecific competition because it tells you about how what an individual of one species is impacting the growth of the other species, the population growth of the other species. Okay, and the way you read this subscript on these alphas, these competition coefficients, is sort of backwards. So this first one, this alpha one, two, this means the impact of an individual of species two on the population growth rate of species one. Okay, so you read it kind of backwards, right? So. This alpha one, two is the impact of an individual of species two on the population growth of species one. Okay, so it's telling you about that interspecific competition relative to the impact of an individual of species one on itself, on its own population. So relative to intraspecific, okay? So remembering inter, between species, intra, within species, okay? So then similarly, if you look at this competition coefficient, reading the subscripts, sort of backwards again. This is the impact of an individual of species one on the population growth of species two, so interspecific, relative to how species two affects itself, okay? Relative to intra-specific of species two, all right? So those are the definitions of the two competition coefficients that show up in those two equations, okay? So basically the alpha value is telling you the strength of inter versus intra specific competition effect on population growth. Okay, so it's telling you the, the relative impacts of those two parts, inter versus intra. Okay, so then we can we can look at the value of, of what that alpha value is. So if the negative impact of an individual of one species on the other species is the same, okay, so if the impact, if the negative impact, I'm having trouble with keeping my mouse visible here, sorry. If the, if the negative impact of an individual of one species on the other species is the same for both species, so they impact each other the same, then that alpha value is one, right? Because it's the same. If on the other hand, the alpha greater than one, this means that the impact of an individual of the other species is greater than that of the individual, of, of the impacts of the individuals of your own species. So it means that interspecific is stronger, okay? So again, if that alpha value is greater than one, the impact of an individual of the other species is greater than that of an individual of one's own species. So interspecific is stronger. And think about that, this, this uh, symbol, this is the greater than symbol, right? So this is talking about when the impact of the other species is greater. So the greater than symbol goes with the impact of the other species is greater, interspecific. So then if you go to the, the alphas less than one, now the impact of an individual, the other species is less than the impact of one's own species, right? So now intraspecific is stronger. 
And you can couple it again with the less than sign goes with the less than impact for another species, for the opposite species, okay? So again, if the impact of, of the two species is the same, you have an alpha value of one. Alpha is greater than one. It means that inter-specific is stronger. Impact of the other species is greater. If the coefficient is less than one, then the impact of the other species is less than, right? So that means intraspecific is stronger because the impacts of, of your own species on yourself is greater instead, okay? So that's how those, um, how those uh, competition coefficients play out. Okay. So these equations can be used to predict the outcome of competition over time. And to do this, we have to find the equilibrium values. So we have to determine the equilibria. And those equilibria, that's um, the population sizes for species one and species two for which population growth is zero. Okay, so at equilibrium, population growth is zero. So population sizes for both species at which population growth for both species is zero. Okay, that's an equilibrium value. So if, if population growth is zero, if population growth is zero, then the population sizes are not gonna change over time, right? If there's no population growth, population sizes are not gonna change. So we have an equilibrium. We've reached an equilibrium value, no more changes, okay? So it's, um, you know, the, a situation in which population size remains the same over time. Okay, so that's an equilibrium. Right? So again, if population growth is zero, the population sizes are not changing over time. So we have reached an equilibrium, right? A situation in which the conditions remain the same. It's a steady, a steady situation. So um, for the case of this vodka Volterra model, it's the population sizes for both species at which population is, growth is zero for both species. And there's three steps to figure this out. And I'm going to verbally tell you them now just as a summary and then we're going to walk through in great detail each one of them um, but the three steps in general to find these equilibria the first step is to find the equal uh, is to determine the combination of population sizes of species one and species two for which species one's growth is zero so that's the first step to figure out the combination for which species one's growth is zero the second step then is to figure out the combinations of population sizes of species one and species two for which species two's growth is zero. Okay, so first we figure out where it is for when species one's growth is zero, then we figure it out for when species two's growth is zero. And then finally, we put those conditions together in step three to find the combinations of population sizes for both species for which population growth of both is zero, okay? So that's the sort of steps we're going to go through. First, where is species one's growth zero? Second, where is species two's growth zero? And third, combination of where is the growth for both zero, okay? All right, so let's, I'm going to orient you on, on some of these uh, graphs as we do this first. So first, um, to understand the predictions of the model, we have to look at uh, graphs that show the sizes of the population, so you know how they increase and decrease. Um, when we start with different combinations of population sizes. So again, N1, that means population size of species one. N2, that's population size of species two, right? The subscripts are telling you which species. So um, again, to understand the, how the, the predictions of the model work, we need to look at graphs that show the size of each population as it increases or decreases if we have different combinations of population sizes. So, you know, maybe when N1 is low or N2 is low or when N1 is high and, um, and N2 is high, right? So those types of graphs that allow us to look at that are what's here on the screen. These are called state space graphs. So on the left, you have the state space graph for species one. On the right, you have the state space graph for species two, okay? Um, and so the, basically in these graphs, the abundance of one species is plotted on the x-axis and the abundance of the other species is plotted on the y-axis. So in this case, I have the abundance of species one on the y-axis and the abundance of species two on the x-axis, okay? So again, that's, so the variable for the y-axis is the abundance of species one. The variable on the x-axis is the abundance for species two. That's what the subscripts mean on those ends. And then each point in this state space graph, every point here, right? These are x, y coordinates, right? So every point, that's in that space on the graph 
represents a combination then of abundances of the two species, right? So like where my arrow is right now, that's going to be, you know, the, sorry, my arrow disappeared. That's going to be, you know, the, the population size for species two and the spot population size for species one, right? So X, Y coordinates in that state space representing the combinations of population sizes of the two species, okay? And then for each species, so on, on the left, I have species one, there's a line here, and here's the line for species two. And that, that line is called the zero isocline. So that's what I've got on the title of the slide here. So that is the zero isocline for species one, and this is the zero isocline for species two, okay? And so at every given point, if we go back to this one for species one, at any given point along that line, it represents the combination of abundances for the two species where species one is not growing. Its growth is zero, okay? So it's the zero isocline for species one. So the X, Y coordinates for here, this is the combination of species two and species one abundances for which species one is not growing, zero growth, okay? So the combination of abundances of the two species where species one's population is not increasing or decreasing, right? So all the points along this line are combinations of abundances of the two species for which species one is not growing. So similarly, all the points along this line are combinations of the abundances of species one and two for which species two is not changing its population growth. Its population growth is zero. It's not changing its population size, okay? So again, all the points along the line back to the species one isocline, all those coordinates, all those N2, N1 coordinates on that line, those combinations of those two population sizes, all along their population growth for species one is zero, okay? And the way you get this zero isocline is by calculating, it's calculated by setting the DN over DT got my camera reversed, but the DN over DT part, right? That population growth, right? Remember DN over DT is the change in population size with respect to change in time, right? So the way you figure out where that zero isocline is, is you set that DN over DT equal to zero, and then you solve for the N value, okay? So there's, again, some math um, involved with how that works. Okay, so that gets you oriented at least to these uh, state space graphs because we're going to use those now to talk about um, developing the log of Volterra model. Okay. Okay, so I told you that there's those three steps we need to do. So the first step, this is step one, right, is to figure out um, the population sizes for which species one's growth is zero. Okay. So the graph that's on the left and the right is the same thing. And the one on the right, I've just added these arrows because they'll become important in how we talk about how the populations change, okay? All right, so if you look at it, when you draw this, this isocline, this zero isocline, it divides the graph, the state space graph into two pieces, right? There's the piece of the graph that's below that isocline and there's the piece of the graph that's above, okay? So below the isocline, the population size here for species one um, is going to increase, right? Because it's below that um, the zero isocline and it's below carrying capacity for species one. So if you're in this place in the graph, the population for species one is going to grow because you're below that zero isocline. You're below carrying capacity. Anywhere above this space, you have now exceeded right on the on the y axis we're talking about species 1 above this in this space of the state space graph you have gone above carrying capacity you've gone above this zero isocline which means the population has exceeded carrying capacity and so you're going to have negative growth it's going to come down right thinking about it along the trajectory of this y axis that's all we're looking at right now we're not considering population of species 2 right now we're just thinking about species 1 this is the one we're interested in okay so again that zero isocline, it divides the state space graph into two pieces. When you're below it, it means you're below the zero growth line, you're below carrying capacity. So the, the tendency is for the population to increase, go up. That's what this up arrow is representing. In this piece of the state space graph, you're now above the zero isocline, you are above carrying capacity on that y-axis. Now the population is gonna decrease in size because you've exceeded carrying capacity. Hence the downward trending arrow in that section of the space state space graph. Okay. Okay. So um, 
I got a, a bit ahead of myself there, but that's uh, the, that's the gist of what this is telling you. So for the, the graph then of this isocline, the zero isocline for species one, again, the, the, the line intersects the graph, right? So it intersects on the y-axis at K1, which is carrying capacity for species one. Okay, that's carrying capacity. So at that point on the graph, there's no individuals of species two present, right? Right. We're at zero for species two. Every everybody is just species one. We're at the carrying capacity of species one. There are zero individuals of species two. Okay. No individuals of species two are present. And then over here, this uh, isocline intersects on the x-axis at this value of K1 over alpha one two, right? So this is basically when the carrying capacity um, of species one is instead filled by the equivalent number of individuals of species two. So species two is taken over, right? And now there's there's no individuals of species one, right? Species two has, has filled that carrying capacity, right? So that's what that means, that K1 over alpha one two, um, when the carrying capacity for species one is instead filled by the same number of individuals of species two instead. Okay, the equivalent number of individuals of species two, there's no individuals of species one present, right? Okay, so now we're gonna, we wanna find um, the population sizes um, for which um, the species one growth is zero, right? Um, and so to find population sizes for species one's growth to be zero, we have to take the growth equation for species one and set it to zero, right? This is the kind of math that we've talked about before. So I'm going to uh, go to the blackboard um, to do this part. Okay. Okay. All right. So going back to the, the so I'm gonna, we're doing species one right now. So I'm going to start out by writing out the species one equation, right? So if you remember, here's, here's the general logistic model, but right, we have to add the extra part, the extra part being that competition coefficient. So I'm going to start by doing that. So we have dn, but it's a one, right? So we're talking about uh, species one, right? We've got an r1, right? N1, okay? And then the part of the uh, parentheses, right? So we've got the k1 minus the n1, but now we're adding that uh, competition coefficient. So it's alpha one, two, times n2, right? Remember that? And then it's all over k1, okay? So that's that's the growth equation for species one, right? dn1 over dt equals r1, n1, and then times the density dependent part, k1 minus n1, the competition coefficient, minus alpha one, two, n2 over k1, okay? Now, so as I said, to figure out the population sizes for which species one's growth is zero, we have to set this growth equation to zero, right? Because I have a blackboard, I can do this easily. I just erase this, right? And set it to zero, okay? So that's the first step. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do is uh, multiply both sides of the equation by K1, so I can get rid of this denominator and just deal with the rest of the equation, okay? So I'm gonna multiply, right, because zero times K1 is still zero, because zero times anything is zero. And if I times this side by K1, then I get rid of the K1, right? So I'm gonna do that. So now, we have this, right? So now we have zero is equal to R1, N1, times in the parentheses k1 minus n1 minus alpha 1 2 n2 okay i'll let you guys catch up writing that hopefully parentheses everybody okay so far with that i hope okay all right so now the left side of the equation is zero. Something over here also has to be zero, right? This is a kind of discussion we had before when we talked about the fact that K over two is when growth rate is maximized for a population, right? So there's three terms on this side of the equation. 
there's the R1, there's the N1, and then there's this term that's in parentheses. One of those three terms has to be equal to zero. Do you think R1 could be equal to zero based on our conversation similar to this before? Does anybody want to jump in and make an answer? R is the maximum per capita growth rate, right? Do you think that that value could be zero? No. No, it doesn't make sense, right? How can the maximum per capita growth rate be zero? I mean, there would be no population growth. That doesn't make any sense. All right, so similarly, N1, N1 is the population size for species one. Does it make sense that that would be zero? I'm leading you. It doesn't, right? Because then species one wouldn't even exist. And so then why are, why are we even doing this, right? So it doesn't make sense for the maximum per capita growth rate of species one to be zero. It doesn't make sense for the population size of species one to be zero. Because it, in both of those cases, then the population doesn't even exist. And the whole point is we're trying to figure out where population growth of species one is zero. So that means that these it's not these parts that equal zero. It's got to be the part that's in the parentheses, okay? That has to be the part of the equation that's equal to zero. Okay? So that's the, you know, the ecologically interesting part of it, okay? The part that's in the, in the parentheses. Okay. So we want to find out the population size for species one when population growth is zero. So what we want to solve for is N1, right? We want to solve for uh, population size of species one, okay? So we want to, so we can take off the parentheses now because we're just dealing with this part, right? So now we've just got zero is equal to that, but we want to figure out we want to solve for N1. This is the thing we're interested in, right? We want to know the population size at which species one's growth is zero, okay? So when we solve for, for N1, right, we're going to get N1. We can bring N1 to the other side of the equation, right? K1 minus alpha 1, 2, N2. Okay, so we have that, right? I've just brought the N1 to the other side of the equation. Now, if you look at this equation, maybe it's going to start to look familiar, and this is a discussion we've had before as well, about the formula for a straight line, right? If you remember, the formula for a straight line is y equals mx plus b, right? Remember that? Okay, remembering that that's the formula for a straight line. So I'm going to rearrange this just a little bit. Um, to, to help see that a little bit better. So it's still N1, but I'm going to move this guy over. Minus alpha, 1, 2, N2, plus K1. So now this is in the formula of Y equals MX plus B. N1 is, is on the Y axis, if you look at your graph, right? K1 is the intercept, right? B is the intercept, if you remember. So then the slope, according to this, right? M is the slope. Minus alpha one two is the slope, and that makes sense. It's a negative linear line, right? And then uh, the x is n two, right? So this is now in this formula y equals mx plus b. Y is the n one axis. The slope is minus alpha one two, right? The x is n two, and the intercept. Is K1. So now you have that equation for a line. Okay. Okay. So from this, of course, we can also solve to determine what the x-intercept is, right? So you can see it on your on the graph on the screen. The x-intercept is there is K1 over alpha 1, 2. But we can figure out, we can also solve for that mathematically, like we've been doing. So we can determine the x uh, intercept by setting the value of y equal to zero, right? Setting this y value equal to zero. So if we do that, right, if we set it to equal to zero, right, we get zero, 
K1 minus alpha 1 or 2 and 2. Then we just, again, we solve for it. And we end up, when you do the math, the simple math, if you do it, you get that K1 over alpha 1 and 2. And that's what we have there for the intercept, K1 over alpha 1, 2. So the n2 value, right? Wait, um, why were you able to set n1 equal to zero? Uh, because I want to find the x-intercept, and right, the x-intercept is when n1 is equal to zero, right? So I think that was Cameron that asked. So if I go back to my screen, right, if you this value, if you go across, it's zero on that y-axis, right? You see my arrow? So that's how we can figure out where the crossing point here is on the x-axis by setting the y to zero. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, great to ask, thanks, yeah. I can turn up my volume because I'm having a bit of a hard time hearing you guys. Okay, all right. So that's how we get the species one info, okay? So then when we you know put it on a graph, which is, which is what you have on your screen again, right? So this again is the, the zero isocline, right? The slope of this line is that minus alpha one, two, okay? And the, the y-intercept is K1 and the x-intercept is K1 over alpha one, two. Okay, so then if, you, if we go back to interpreting the arrows in this state space graph, so we're in, when we're in this area of the state space graph below that zero isocline, right? That's the, com any XY coordinate in there, in there is the combination of population sizes of species one and species two that are below the carrying capacity of species one. So species one will grow. In this area of the state space graph, any combinations of uh, population sizes of species one and two, so those XY coordinates are above that zero isocline, above the carrying capacity, which means population size of species one is going to have to come down, right? Because it's exceeded carrying capacity, right? So this could represent a situation, you know, so um, you know, this could be, um, sorry, a situation where there are a few individuals of the two species and, you know, there's plenty of resources, right? Down here, there's lots of resources. Everybody gets what they need. So population size of species one can go up. I mean, this is the kind of stuff we talked about for density independent discussions before. Up here, well, now the resources are getting depleted and there's uh, things are getting a little tough. And so uh, competition causes the population growth to go negative, okay? All right, okay, so that's, if you remember, uh, so that's step one, right? To figure out population sizes of both species for which species one's population growth is zero. Step two, is to then find out the population sizes for which species two's growth is zero. Okay, so now I have the species two line, um, the species two sp state space graph drawn here, right? And so if you remember the species two graph, if you go back to an earlier, I'm gonna see which slide number it was that showed the graph. So slide three showed the equations for both species, right? So if you go back and you look at that slide and you look at the equation for species two, you'll see it looks like the one we did for species one, except all the ones and twos are now reversed, right? So it means if we go through all those same steps that are right here that we did for species one, we can do the same exact steps and solve for the, the, uh, the, equilibrium, the species two zero growth, okay? So you can do all those same steps. Um, again, you know, we're going to get the zero growth of isocline for species two, right? It's going to have an intercept on that x-axis that's K2, carrying capacity of species two. It's going to have an intercept on this y-axis that's K2 over alpha 2, 1. If you, if you look, these are the reversed um, values that were on the species one graph, okay? So what I would really like you to do is to go through all those steps that I did on the board for species one, but do it for species two and make sure that you can solve it so you get the same outcome and you get these correct values um, on the, uh, the axes, okay? It's the same that y equals mx plus b steps and everything. So doing that um, and um, 
that would be really great practice for you to uh, come to the same conclusion, right? So we'll, we look at it here again in the, in the state space combinations of uh, population sizes of species one and species two, but now we're talking about the species two population. So we're, we're working everything on the x-axis now. So below the zero isocline, right? We are below the carrying capacity for species two. These all the eight, the X, Y coordinate combinations of population sizes of species one and species two here are below the zero isocline for species two. So species two can increase in size, right? So increasing means moving that way as the arrow indicates. When we're over here in the state space graph, all these X, Y coordinates that are combinations of population sizes of species one and two, we are now above carrying capacity for species two, right? Resources are gonna be depleted. Things are getting really tough. So species two is gonna decrease in size. So the arrow points you know, on the trajectory of going lower, right? On that X axis, because we're paralleling these arrows to the X axis, because now we're talking about it with respect to species two, which is labeled, which is uh, graphed on the X axis. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so again, what I really want you to do for practice as you're studying for the final exam is to do the steps that I did on the blackboard for species one, but apply it here to species two and work through it. Okay, and uh, that's something we can uh, go over during the review lecture at the end of the term. Um, or even if today at the end of the lecture, if we have enough time, we can do it again. But I really want you guys to work on that. Okay. Um, when we're above the zero isocline for species two, would it automatically mean that species one could also be declining or could they be increasing because their hearing capacity isn't reached? Well, that is a good question. And it reflects the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, that's step three. That's exactly step three, Brooke. So this is now where we put, now we want to find the uh, the situations for which population growth for both species one and species two is zero. So those first two steps we were just doing species one and species two sort of in isolation, but now we're going to put them together and we're going to look at the combinations of both. So then we can talk about what's happening for both species one and species two. Okay. So these are situations for which now neither population is changing. So we're going to try to work out these equilibria now that I mentioned at the start. So to do this, we plot now the, the isoclines for both species one and species two on the same set of axes. Okay. So there's four different ways that you can do this. There's, you know, four combinations of the two isoclines uh, that can be plotted. And so I've got them summarized here and we're going to go through them in each detail. But here's case one. Case one is when the species one isocline is above the species two isocline. Case two is when species two is above species one. Case three is when the lines cross, but the K values, the carrying capacity values are lower than the K over alpha values. Case four, again, the lines cross, but now the carrying capacity values are higher than the K over alpha values. Okay, so those are the four ways that the lines can be plotted on a single set of axes. So you can have a state space graph that has both species. So we're gonna zoom in and look at each one in more detail. So starting with that case one, case one is when species one, the red isocline is above species two, the blue isocline, okay? So now, so I, I showed you how we can look at how, we can use the arrows to talk about how an individual species is growing. Now we're gonna put it together and talk about how both species are growing in different pieces of the state space graph. So in the, in the case where just species one was shown, we divided the state space graph into two pieces basically. But now with both species plotted there, we have three pieces that the state space graph is now divided into. So to start out with the easiest one, if we go down here in the bottom left corner, we are below the isocline for both species one and species two. So both species are still growing, right? So we show that here. So we're below the isocline for species one, right? Species one is plotted on the y-axis. So the arrow points up, species one is growing. We are also below the isocline for species two. So species two is growing. So the arrow points to the right. 
This line in the middle, this arrow, this is the common vector. So altogether, when you, this is the common vector of direction of population change there, okay? The other really simple one is we go up here and we're above both of those zero isoclines. So for species one, we have a decrease, right? Species one has exceeded its carrying capacity. It needs to come down. We have also exceeded the carrying capacity for species two. So it also, it points back towards decreasing, okay? And then again, the common vector there is right here, okay? So the common vector of those two comes to the middle. Okay, now it gets a little more interesting. We have to think about what's happening in this piece of the state space graph. In this case, we are below the species one isocline, but above the species two isocline. So if we are below species one, then species one is still growing, right? So that is the up pointing arrow, right? But because we're above species two's isocline, species two is gonna decrease, it's exceeded its carrying capacity. So the common vector here is this arrow pointing in this direction. So if you follow all the common vectors, the trajectory of here, of this, uh, the final outcome sends you right here to the value of K1. This is the equilibrium point. And what happens at this point is species one has excluded species two. Species one has won the competition with species two. And now with the equilibrium point, the trajectory of all of those arrows, those vectors, takes us to the carrying capacity of species one. And you know that when we are at that point on the graph, there are zero individuals of species two left, right? So species one has competitively excluded. Competition resulted in the exclusion of species two. Species one has won the competition. There are no individuals of species two left, okay? I hope that makes sense. So that's that common trajectory, okay. So we can look at this, we can understand why this is happening based on the relative contributions of inter and intraspecific competition for each of the two species. And we can do that by looking at what's happening on the graph axes. So we're gonna to go to the board and we're gonna do this again. So as I said, we're going to be looking at what's happening with regards to the relative strengths of inter and intraspecific competition and what and basically what the outcome of the competition is based on how each species is impacted, whether that's more by inter or intraspecific competition. Okay, so we can do this by looking at the K values and the K over alpha values on each of the axes of that graph. Okay. So first, um, let's do it looking at the N1 axis. We'll look at the Y axis first. So if you look at the values on there, on that axis, the K1 value is a bigger number than the K2 over alpha value, right? This is higher up on the axis. So the K1 value is a bigger number. So if you look at that, so K1 is a bigger number, so I'm using, um, an inequality, so not an equal signs, right? We're using inequalities here. So K1 is a bigger number than the K2 over alpha 2, 1 value, right? So again, that's just based on what you see right there on that N1 axis, that Y axis. K1 is a bigger number, bigger than the K2 over alpha 2, 1, okay? So we start with that, but what, what we want to do is we want to get all the species one impacts together on the same side of that inequality. Okay, so we do that just by multiplying both sides of the equation by the alpha value, right? So if we multiply both sides of the equation, right, and that'll also get rid of this um, fraction, right? So we're going to multiply both sides of the equation by alpha two one because we want to get all the, all the one species one interactions together, right? So if you remember, the definition of this competition coefficient, that's the impact of species one on species two, right? So we're going to multiply both sides by this alpha one, two. So we end up with K1 
alpha 2, 1 is a bigger number than K2. Okay, so again, I just multiply both sides by that alpha 2, 1. Okay, so now we have K1, alpha 2, 1 is a bigger value than K2. Okay, so what this means is that when species one is at its carrying capacity, the, that the impact of species one on species two is greater than the impact of species two on itself. Okay, so what this means is when species one is at its carrying capacity, the impact of species one on species two is greater than the impact of species two on itself on the less than side, right? Okay, so again, species one is affecting species two more than species two is affecting itself. So what that says then is that species two is getting its butt kicked by species one, right? The impact, so species Two is more regulated by inter-specific competition. It's more regulated by what species one is doing to it, right? Than it is by intraspecific, by what it's doing to itself. Okay. Right? I hope that makes sense. Right? Remembering that this alpha value tells you about that competition coefficient. Okay. So that's what's that's what you can look at on that N1 axis, right? When we're trying to talk about species one. We can do the same thing on the N2 axis. Okay. So let's do the same thing on the N2 axis. If we look at that axis, right now, the K2 value is a smaller value than the K1 over alpha value. Okay. So we're going to do the same thing on that axis now. So this, again, this was the N1 axis. Now we'll look at what's happening on the N2 axis, okay? So now that K2 value, as I just said, right, is less than that K1 over alpha 1, 2 value, right? That's just what's going on on that X axis, on that X axis, that N2 axis. K2 is a smaller number, a smaller value than K1 over alpha 1, 2, right? So again, because we're talking about the N2, the population uh, of species two, we want to get all the species two parts together. So again, we just multiply both sides of the inequality by this alpha 1, 2 to get it together over here. So now we've got K2 alpha 1, 2 is less than K1. So now we can interpret this as well. So what this is saying is that the impact of species one on itself is greater than the impact of species two on species one when species two is at its carrying capacity, okay? So K1 is more worried about itself, intraspecific, right? Species one is not impacted much at all by species two. That's on the less than side of the equation. So from this, you can see that species one is more regulated by intraspecific, right? I hope that makes sense. Okay, so species one is more impacted by intraspecific competition. So again, this means that the impact of species two at its carrying capacity on species one is less than the impact of species one on itself. Species one is regulated by intraspecific competition. Species two is regulated by interspecific competition. Okay. So what we see from that then is that competitive exclusion, it happens, it occurs when one species is more regulated by intraspecific competition and the other more regulated by interspecific competition. Okay, so in this case, it's species one, as I said, that's more regulated by intraspecific. Species one is more worried about individuals of its own species, right? 
So species one is the one that wins because basically if it's only worried about individuals in its own species, it's sort of operating in like, you know, it's not like species two is even there, right? And so then it makes sense that species one is the species that's gonna win. It's gonna competitively exclude species two because it's sort of operating in, without even acknowledging almost that species two is there, right? Species one is more worried about individuals of species one in tra specific competition, right? So in tra is what is regulating species one. And so for the species that is more regulated by intra, that is the species that wins in this competitive exclusion type of situation, okay? And we could see, you could almost predict that, this, this, that you, maybe you predicted that this is what would have happened because the species one isocline is above the species two isocline, right? So you may have, and the, so that means the carrying capacity of species one is the value that's higher up. So you might've already guessed that it was gonna be species one that would win this whole contest, right? Because it's already, it's isocline is above that of species two. Okay, so this is the equilibrium point. The equilibrium point is the carrying capacity for species one. Species one competitively excludes species two. Species one wins this competition. Species one is more regulated by intra specific competition. It doesn't care about species two. So here's sort of just a, a, a recap of that again. And I've added some more arrows to try and show you the, um, the trajectory of those vectors, right? So when species one isocline, again, is above the species two, so the red one, species one, is above species two, species one is more regulated by intra-specific competition than inter, right? It doesn't really care about species two. But species two is more regulated by inter. It's getting its butt kicked by species one, right? So species two is more regulated by inter-specific competition, right? And this results in competitive exclusion Species two gets its butt whipped and it's not even there anymore. Species one wins competitive exclusion. So we head towards the trajectory of these vectors heads towards the carrying capacity of species one. Okay. There are no individuals of species two left. Okay. You can do the exact same thing. Not exact. We're going to switch the, the subscripts around again, but now we have the case where the species two isocline is the one that's higher up. So you might already guess what's going to happen, right? The trajectory is going to send this competitive situation over towards K2, towards the carrying capacity of species two. Species two is going to competitively exclude species one, okay? So again, we can do this by considering the what's happening in the dis different pieces of the state space graph. All right, starting at the easy part, the bottom left, little fraction here, we are below the isoclines for both species. So both species are increasing. So species one increases as indicated by an upward pointing arrow along that Y axis. Species two is increasing as indicated by a parallel line on the X axis, right? The common vector then is right there in the middle. Similarly, at the top part of the state space graph, we are above the isoclines for both species. So both species are declining. Species one is declining, downward pointing arrow. Species two is declining, left facing arrow. And now again, we have a common vector this way. Okay, so the interesting piece again is when we get in between the two zero isoclines, right? We have to consider which one we're above and which one we're below. So in this case, here's species two. We're below the species two isocline, which means species two is still growing, right? So we have a right hand pointing arrow. However, we are above the species one isocline. Species one is competing the heck out of its resources. So species one decreases. The common vector then goes this way, right? So if you send the common vector trajectories, you will head here towards the carrying capacity of species two, where species two competitively excludes species one. Now, based on what I told you from the last example of case one where species one was above who do you think which of the two species here is more regulated by itself by intraspecific competition species two yes and which species is more regulated by interspecific species okay. one species one is getting his butt kicked by species two and species two is operating basically without even paying attention to species one 
species two is just um, working on individuals of its own species to compete with. So we can do the exact same exercise that we did here by looking at the values on the X and the Y axes and looking again at those relative strengths of inter and intra specific competition. So let's just go ahead and do it just to work through it again. Okay. So as, as we did above, as we did before, so we'll start with the N1 axis. Okay. So in the N1 axis, we have K2 over alpha 2, 1, which is a bigger value. So it's on the greater than side of K1. Right. And again, we want to get all of the to the species one stuff together on the same side of the inequality. So we multiply both sides of the equation, not equation, inequality, by that alpha two one, right? So we end up with K2 is bigger than K1 alpha two one. So this says that the impacts of K2 of species two on itself is greater than the impact of species one on species two. Right? So when species species two then here is more regulated by that intraspecific competition, right? So it's more worried about itself. The impacts of species one on species two, basically negligible. It's not I think it's on the, the, the smaller less than side of the equation, the inequality. And we can do the same thing for that x-axis at the bottom, right? Now we have K1 over alpha 1, 2, right, is a smaller value than K2. Again, we want to get all the species 2 impacts together. So we're going to multiply both sides of the inequality by the alpha 1, 2 value. So K1 is less than K2 alpha 1, 2, right? And so this is saying that the impact of species 2 on species 1 is greater than the impact of species one on itself. Okay, so the impact of species two on species one, right, is greater than the impact of species one on itself. Okay, so as we already, you know, as, you, as somebody said, um, this shows you, right, that for the species that's more regulated by intraspecific, in this case, it's species two. Species two is going to be the species that wins, right? And species one is getting its butt, its butt kicked, right? And it's not going to win out on this one. So I have a, just, again, a summary that shows, again, the arrows pointing towards how this is going to go. So species two isocline is above the species one isocline. Species two is more regulated by intra-specific, right? It's more regulated by intra-specific than inter-specific. Species one is more regulated by inter-specific competition with species two. So the result is species two wins. The equilibrium point is competitive exclusion. Species two has outcompeted species one. Species one no longer exists in this environment. So the arrows go towards that uh, K2 value, the carrying capacity of species two. That is the equilibrium point for this. No individuals of species one are left. Okay. Okay. So the third case is when we have the isoclines crossing, but in this case, it's when the K values on each axis are lower than the K over alpha values. So the K values are lower than the K over alpha values on both of those axes, okay? So now we're gonna go through the same sort of exercise, okay? Now we have four places in the state space graph to think about, okay? Again, we'll start with the easy one. The bottom left, we're below both species isoclines, so both are growing, right? So species one is growing up its y-axis, species two is growing along its x-axis, the common vector is here. In the upper part of the graph, again, we're above both species isoclines, so they're both decreasing. Species one decreases, species two decreases, and the common vector then is going this way. So you might you can already see where this is headed. All right, so here it gets a little trickier now when we go into these two components of the state space graph. So in this top left one, right, we are below the species two isocline, but we're above the species one isocline. 
Okay. So if we are above the species one isocline, that means species one has gone above its carrying capacity. So it has to come down, has to decrease, but we're still below species two. So species two can increase and the common vector then goes that way. Okay. Over here in this bottom right quad, quadrant section, we're now below the species one isocline, but above the species two isocline. So species one can still grow, but species two is coming down because we've gone past its isocline. Common vector again goes to the middle. So every vector is converging on this point where the two lines cross. So the equilibrium point is, it's interesting because now both species one and species two are here. The species are coexisting. So when you have the case where the K over alpha values are greater than the K values, you have an equilibrium point where the species can coexist. They can live there together and they're doing okay, right? So here we can also figure out, you know, why this is the case by again, looking at the relative strengths of inter and intra specific competition. Again, looking at the N1 axis, what's happening there and looking at the N2 axis and what's happening there. So let's do it. Okay, so we'll do the N1 axis first. We'll do the Y axis first. So the K2 over alpha 2, 1, right? That's a bigger value, right, than the K1, right? That's just what's happening on that N1 axis. The K2 over the K2 over alpha two one is a bigger number, a bigger value than the K1 value. Again, we want to get all the impacts of species one together on one side of the inequality, so we multiply both sides by this alpha one two. So now we've got K2 is bigger than K1 alpha two one. So this says that the impacts of K2 of species two on itself, right? The impacts of species two on itself are greater than the impacts of species one on species two. So species two is more regulated by intraspecific competition, okay? The impacts of species two on itself, and species two that carry capacity, that's a bigger impact than the impact of species one on species two, okay? So species two is regulated by intraspecific. I'm wondering if you can guess where this is gonna go um, on the other axis. So on the other axis now we have K2, right, is a smaller value than K1 over alpha one, two. And again, we wanna get all of the species two impacts together on one side of the inequality. So we're gonna multiply both sides by the alpha one, two. So K2 alpha 1, 2 is a smaller value than K1. So here, similarly to this, to what happened on the, on the N1 y axis, now we see that species 1 is more regulated by individuals of itself than it is by the impact of species 2. So the impacts of individuals of species one on themselves in trust specific competition is greater than the impacts of species two on species one, right? So species one and species two are both more regulated by intraspecific specific competition. So basically the biological interpretation, right? Is that they're both more worried about individuals of their own species than individuals of the other species. So doesn't it make sense then that they can coexist because they're kind of operating in sort of, you know, not even really recognizing that the other species is there, okay? When both species are regulated more by intraspecific competition than interspecific, the species can coexist because they're not too much worried about the other species there. They can coexist, okay? Would this only occur if the species operated in like different niches? Yes, and I have an, that's such a good question. Um, I have an example at the end of birds and seed sizes that shows this sort of as a more realistic example. Excellent question. Okay, 
So then the fourth and final case, what are we doing for time? We're okay. Um, so the fourth and final case, again, okay, they're crossing, right? And now though, the K values are higher up than the K over alpha values on each axis, okay? So now the isoclines for the two species cross again, but the K values are higher values than the K over alpha values, okay? So again, we can go through each of the four pieces of the state space, state space graph as usual. You know that's bottom left, both species are increasing because we're under the isoclines for both. Above, we're above the isoclines for both, so both species have to decrease. So you have the common trajectories there. Now it gets a little more interesting. In the upper left corner, now we are above the isocline for species two, right? So species two has to decrease, but we're below the isocline for species one, so species one can still grow. So the, the vector now points up here to K1. Down here, we are below the species two isocline, so species two can still grow, but we're above the species one isocline, so species one has to go down. So now the trajectory could possibly go here to K2, right? So this is sort of interesting. Um, there's two possible outcomes now. We have two possible equilibria. So we can have this one where species one does competitively exclude species two, or we could have this one where species two competitively excludes species one. And we call this mutual antagonism. Noting that this crossing point here is not, uh, it's an unstable equilibrium, it doesn't exist. And so we don't, we don't pay attention to that one, it doesn't exist. So we have two possible outcomes. So what ends up happening in the end is gonna sort of depend on the starting point. So in a natural system, say you have an unoccupied um, patch of habitat and a new, you know, some new individuals are moving in. If species one arrives before species two, then we'll probably head to this equilibrium point. But say species two has a higher per capita growth rate, it has a higher RM value, well then we might actually head over towards this one. So which way the equilibrium point goes depends on which species had a bit of a leg up on the other one at the start. Now, in case three, we determined that it was intraspecific competition that regulated both, both species more. In this case, what do you think is going to be the case? Both species will be uh, more regulated by interspecific competition? Exactly. Both species are now more worried about the other species than they are worried about themselves. And we can do it again by looking at our N1 and N2 axes on the graph. And just prove it to yourself that it now becomes a bigger story about interspecific competition. Okay, so again, we'll do the, the N1 axis first. So the K1 value right, is a bigger value than the K2 over alpha 2, 1 value, right? Okay, that, again, that's just going by what's on that N1 axis. K1 is a bigger value than K2 over alpha 2, 1. Again, we want to get all the impacts of species 1 together on one side of the inequality, so we multiply both sides by the alpha 2, 1, right? So we have K1, alpha 2, 1, is a bigger value than K2. So right away you see that the impacts of species one on species two are greater than the impacts of species two on itself, right? Interspecific is the bigger issue here, just as you predicted. All right, if we do the same thing on the N2 axis, right? So now we have K1 over alpha one, two, right? That's a smaller value than K2. Again, let's get the impacts all together on the same sides of the inequality. So we multiply both sides by the alpha one, two. Okay. And so now this is saying that the impact of species two on species one is greater than the impacts of species one on itself. Again, interspecific is what's regulating things more than intraspecific for species one and for species two, okay? So the relative impacts, right? This is what this inequality sign is telling us. The relative impact of interspecific competition is much greater than intraspecific competition, okay? 
So the impacts of species two on species one are greater than the impact of species one on itself. Okay. So just as you guys predicted, um, when both species are more regulated by interspecific competition, you have this mutual antagonism. Okay. And again, which which way, which equilibrium point ends up being the answer is going to depend on which species kind of had a leg up over on the other one at the start of the competitive um, situation. Okay. So again, it could happen when, um, you know, somebody colonizes first or somebody, one species has a higher per capita growth rate than the other. Okay. That's the kind of thing that can happen. All right. Okay. So we had a question about a sort of more realistic example. So here we go. So this is from the, the Smith textbook. So this is a hypothetical interaction of two birds, uh, population, two species of birds that are um, eating seeds. Okay. So for bird species one, this is the size of seed they like to eat. And so their diet is mostly com uh, comprised of this smaller seed size. For species two, most of their diet is comprised of this little bit bigger seed size. So this graph down here is showing you three different environments, A, B, and C, right? And the distribution of the seed size is there. So in environment A, there's mostly small seeds. And in environment C, there's mostly large seeds. And then in environment B, there's, you know, both sides, both sizes of seeds are there. And I bet looking at this, you can already predict what's going to happen, right? You can already probably predict which species will competitively exclude the other, depending on which of these environments you're in and when they might actually, I don't know, coexist. So let's have a look. So here's the, the same kind of uh, graphics that I was just showing you. One thing to keep in mind with this, these ones, that the axes are reversed from what I did. So N1 is now on the x-axis and N2 is now on the y-axis, okay? But in environment um, A, right, where the smaller seeds were, and those are the seeds that species one likes, right, environment A. So the species one isocline is above the species two isocline. And sure enough, you know, species one is the one that wins in environment A, right, because those are the seeds that it likes to eat. In environment C, that's where the bigger seeds were. And if you remember, species two was eating mostly the bigger seeds. And now we have the species two isocline is above the species one isocline. And the trajectory of the vectors goes to there, goes to the K2 value. Species two competitively excludes species one. In environment B, if you remember, this is where there were seeds of both sizes. And sure enough, in this case, we have species one and species two coexisting with each other because they're more worried about competing with themselves than with each other. So individuals within species two are more worried about competing with individuals within their own species than they are about uh, worrying about the other one. So they coexist, okay? Okay, so just to sort of sum that up and I think there's been some chats going, so I'll, I'll uh, just summarize with this and then I'll see if we have some questions to talk about. Okay, um, so, this lotka Volterra model, it's based on the logistic model. And it the, the thing that's happening here, though, is we're taking both intraspecific and interspecific competition into account. We have two species that are interacting. And what we do is look at the relative strengths of inter versus intraspecific competition and see what happens, like what the outcome of population growth is. So competitive exclusion, when you have one species more regulated by interspecific competition and the other or by intraspecific competition. The intraspecific regulated one is the one that wins, okay? Because it's more worried about itself than it is the others, the other species. The species can coexist when both species are regulated more by intra, okay? Because they're not thinking about the other species as much. They're more competing with individuals of their own species, so they can both exist. Both species can exist. On the other hand, mutual antagonism occurs when both species are more worried about the other species. They're just competing like crazy, right? So when both species are regulated more by interspecific competition. Okay. Now I'm going to stop sharing. And go to the chat.
Oh, so there's uh, okay. Uh, some notes, okay. Was it end? Okay, lots of people are answering each other's questions, which is great. Um, is there? Does anybody want to just um, verbalize a question? There's a lot for me to go through in the chat. I don't know who is answered who here. I think they were all answered, but okay. Victoria was the only one who asked a question relevant to the lecture. So I'm. Oh, everybody else is just chatting. Well, that's okay. Okay. All right. So I will say again. I think it would be really important, obviously, to practice all of this. But um, I did not do the case two example for um, showing that it was the y equals mx plus b equation for that zero isocline. So I recommend that you go through those steps to make sure you get it. Um, and we, you know, assuming assuming nothing goes awry, uh, the December seventh lecture slot is uh, saved as a review slot. So that would be a time when we could go through some of this stuff in more detail. And I would recommend that by the time we go to that lecture. You have reviewed your notes so that you've identified exactly what questions you want to ask. I mean, we could have the whole hour and uh, 20 minutes just to, to go over stuff to prepare for the final exam. Okay. But if nobody has anything else, there's only a couple minutes left. You're free to go. Um, I have to get back to babysitting my daughter's Tamagotchi. And I'll see you this afternoon for lab. Thank you. See you later. Yeah. See ya. For this afternoon's lab, um, yes. there wasn't anything due this afternoon, wasn't there? I I um, I had missed the last lab. I was just in Toronto. Yeah. So today, the results and discussion was due last week, right? So there yes. was nothing due today. Okay, perfect. That's what I thought. And I had checked everything like three times just to make sure, but just wanted to clarify. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah, you're welcome.